Our text this morning is Philippians chapter 4. Uh, we are winding down our study, our walk through Philippians, finding joy in all the right places. And uh, of course, you remember that uh, the title stems from the fact that the Apostle Paul in this short letter uh, uses the word joy or rejoice uh, to this church in the city of Philippi at least a dozen times, if not more. And um, he, the overarching theme of the entire book is joy. Remember, Paul was writing from a prison cell in Rome, and yet he talked about the joy that he had and how he rejoiced in the Lord, and we can learn a lot just from that, but also as we've examined this, uh, this book, it has been tremendously uplifting and enlightening, in my opinion, uh, as, as we have learned uh, how to find joy in all the right places, because we've said joy doesn't come from, uh, it doesn't come from possessions, it doesn't come from promotions, it doesn't come from wealth, and, and uh, any other thing. Right? It doesn't come from any of that. Um, it comes from the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to understand, we know that. We, we hear that over and over again. We read that. We, we tell ourselves that. But when the rubber meets the road, sometimes that's harder to live than others, isn't it? Sometimes it's harder to live because we end up putting our eyes and fixing our sight on the things around us and the things that we consider bad or negative. All right, please remember this. God is always in control. And we'll see this uh, as, we, as we move on. We can rejoice in the Lord and should rejoice in the Lord even in uh, the darkest times, the most difficult times. Now, that doesn't mean we can never weep. Matter of fact, Paul said we saw it last week. I say to you now, uh, even weeping, he said that there are those who oppose the cross of, of Christ. Okay? And, and Paul understood sorrow. He, under, he, he experienced all the human emotions that we experience, and yet we can still have joy because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll get into that in just a second. Having said all of that, I want to speak to you today about controlling negative emotion yields joy. Controlling negative emotions yields joy. Two of the most prevalent and powerful negative emotions impacting our lives, and I'd say our society today, are anger and anxiety we are angry and we're anxious now this is evident in our politics it's evident in our online posts it's evident in our driving it's evident in our finances our um, overprotectiveness our overreactions it's evident in our kids a recently published Sacred Heart University study shows that half of Gen Z suffers from eco-anxiety. And that's defined this way. My level of concern for climate change causes physical distress that impacts my daily life. Half of Generation Z is anxious about that. All right? doesn't matter what, what you think about climate change. All right? This generation feels it to the effect that it is impact, adversely impacting their psychological well-being on a daily basis. They're scared. Now, now let me just say this. Many of us here don't have a, a real connection to Gen Z, but we should try. We have the answer to that fear. And we need to share that with them to let them know, hey, by the way, the world is going to end, right? I think it was Billy Graham in a sermon uh, once said, 
I read the last page of the Bible and I know how it ends. And it ends pretty good. For those of us who know Christ. And so, yeah, the world is going to end, but we've got an answer and we've got a, a, a hope. Uh, the earnest expectation of the promises that have been given to us by the one who is faithful to keep his promise. Sadly, professing Christians, in my opinion, are some of the most angry and anxious people I've met. But we don't have to be. I want to remind you, as I just did, that joy is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Nothing else. And that means we need to cultivate our relationship with him. We need to learn how to draw closer to him and walk more closely with him. And let him impact the inner us. I was talking just the other day with somebody who, about... Our, our Christianity had reached a place, I think there's a change, a shift going on, but our Christianity had reached a place that it was all about going to church, keeping certain rules, being a certain, putting forth a certain persona, and very little on the inside. And when you read, all you have to do is read one gospel to understand that Jesus was all about the inside, not the outside. The Pharisees were all about the outside. But Jesus was all about the inner person. In this short portion of Scripture that we're going to read, beginning in verse 1, Paul offers us four keys to controlling anger and anxiety which will produce joy. Look at verse 1 with me. Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore you, Odia, and I implore Suntike, to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Notice those last words, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, last week, we're covering a little bit of ground that we covered last week. We talked about this, this first part of the chapter where uh, two influential women in the church, Euodia and Syntyche, Paul said, the, these, these were warriors for Christ. They battled with me for the gospel, and now I hear that there's a kerfuffle there, there's a squabble. He doesn't go into what it is. They're just having a problem with one another. Listen, we be people. <laughs> we, we are not all the same. Thank God for that, right? Um, I couldn't take you if you were like me all the time, <laughs> right? And vice versa. We're all different. We have different perspectives. We have, we have different ideas. We have different likes and dislikes, right? And that's all part of the beautiful fabric of being a family, 
of being a, a church. And you know what? Every now and again, somebody's going to get on your nerves. Every now and again, somebody's going to say something, whether it's intentional or not. A backhanded compliment. A, a suggestion. Right? You, you name it. A criticism. Uh, whatever it is, they're going to say something you don't like. Oh, well. We cannot let differences divide us. I'm not talking about doctrine. I'm talking about differences. And Paul's concern here was that this squabble, this kerfuffle between these two very influential uh, and, and beloved ladies was going to divide the church. And that's exactly what will happen. I said it last week. When you get two strong personalities who differ on something, guess what? You're going to have two different crowds. Well, I agree with Euodia. Oh, well, I agree with Suntike. And here's why. Well, no, you're wrong. And all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. Listen, we don't need that. We don't need that. And, and Jesus didn't teach that. The Bible doesn't it doesn't encourage that. It encourages quite the opposite. And so Paul called in to, uh, to help Clement and, and this other, my true companion, don't know who that was. There's all sorts of speculation, but nobody knows who that was. It may have been the pastor of the church there at Philippi, but he's saying, I want you to get involved and to help these ladies iron it out and so what can we do to control our negative emotions and live in joy well here's the first thing enjoy the Lord Paul said it twice right here in one verse rejoice in the Lord always and again I'll say it rejoice in the Lord rejoice be glad, be delighted, be joyful. I wonder today if, now listen, I, I don't want you to get the idea that I get out of bed every day clicking my heels, <laughs> skipping down the stairs, <laughs> dancing through the kitchen to the coffee maker, all right? I'm not talking about that. I understand I understand hard times. I understand dark clouds and heavy weight. I understand a heavy heart. Trust me. I do. But I also understand that even through all of that, I can rejoice in the Lord. I can rejoice in the Lord especially because of that. Because he doesn't change. We just saw that in the video, right? He doesn't change. He, and and my, my heartache, my heavy, clouded head, you know, you, it doesn't take him by surprise. The difficulties of my life, he knows about them. What did James say, right? Rejoice. Count it all joy when you enter into different kinds of troubles knowing that the trying of your faith works endurance. So let it work. Let it do its work. Enjoy the Lord. The psalmist said this in Psalm 40 and verse 16, Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Not be glad because of the circumstances. Right? Be glad in you you we have this idea that if i'm seeking god and if i'm praying about something then he's going to intervene and make everything good it's not what the bible says it says all things work together for good but it doesn't say all things will always be good or will always turn to good 
And that's, by the way, that's our terminology. That's our definition, right? And that's oftentimes how we define God and the circumstances in our life. When should I rejoice? Well, Paul told us here, always. At all times and in all circumstances. Always. Why should I rejoice? Let me give you just a few. Just a, just a real short list, and it is just a short list. Because in Christ, I'm accepted. I'm adopted. I'm blessed. I'm chosen. I'm forgiven. By the way, this is an alphabetical order. I'm loved. I'm redeemed. I'm righteous in Him. Short list, right? Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 5, verse 11. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. In Christ, I am reconciled to God. My sins no longer separate me from Him. Woo! That's a good thing, by the way. <laughs> In Christ, I have a new name. I have a new home. I have a new outlook. And by the way, that's not a program on my computer. I'm not talking about that, right? I have a new outlook. I have an inheritance, an eternal inheritance. I have an eternal purpose, a divine purpose. And I have an almighty helper. Listen to this, Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in Him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song, I will praise Him. In Christ, I'm going to heaven. And listen, things in this life might not look so good, might not feel so good, might not be so good, but this life is a drop in the ginormous bucket compared to eternity. Isn't that what Paul said? For these light afflictions that we suffer, but for a moment, will result in eternal glory. And we need to keep that in mind. So enjoy the Lord. One of my, one of my great joys is to see how many of you are enjoying your Christian life. And, and I saw, <clears throat> way back when we first met, some of you, there was no joy. There was this rigidity. There was this, oh, you know, I, and, and this very closed off, that, that kind of Christianity I was talking about earlier. And now, it's like, hey, I can be real. I can be me. I'm in Jesus. I, I can be joyful. And it's so much fun to watch. I love it. So enjoy the Lord. And the second key is this. We find it in verse 5 when Paul wrote this. He said, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Enjoy the Lord and expect the Lord. Jesus is coming back. I know, amen. <laughs> Even so, come quickly, right? Oh, please. He is coming back. It doesn't matter what the naysayers say. It doesn't matter if they call you nuts. What's that? I like nuts. Yeah. It doesn't matter. What matters is what Jesus said. And he said he's coming back. Period. Oh, and by the way, the rest of Scripture backs that up. So I'm good with that. I'm waiting. 
Watch for him. Here's what he said, Matthew 24, beginning in verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you don't know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. What does that mean? One, one, one man, uh, two men in the field, one will be t- left and the other taken. Two women grinding at the, at the mill, one taken, the other left behind. I think that's a clear reference to what we call the rapture. And we believe here that the rapture is a biblical doctrine and that, it, that Jesus is coming back, and the second coming of Christ happens first in the clouds, Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, after the resurrection, as Jesus is on Mount Arbel with, with uh, the disciples, he gives them the, the great commission, and then he ascends into heaven, and they're all like this. And the Bible says angels showed up next to them and said, Um, why are you gazing up into heaven? This Jesus will come in like manner. He will come back the same way he left. He ascended into the clouds. He's coming back on the clouds. And when he does, he's calling those of us who are believers and are alive at that time out. It's the snatching away. And that ushers in the great tribulation period, that seven-year time of Jacob's trouble. At the end of that seven years is when he comes back and steps down on the Mount of Olives. That's when he comes back and sets up his kingdom and rules from Jerusalem, from David's throne. Woo-hoo! Man alive, you talk about... You talk about a department of government efficiency. (laughs) Oh yeah, from the top down, it is going to be something else. But, are you living in a state of readiness? Because that rapture could happen today. The voice of the archangel, the trump of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Boom. Boom. It could happen right now. Wouldn't that be awesome? Here we are in church, pastors preaching, and all of a sudden, he's sitting down and Jesus is there. (laughs) We're in front of Jesus. Wow. And so I, I say to you, expect the Lord. We know this, but we tend not to live it. Watch for Him. Revelation 1-7 He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even they who pierced Him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of Him. That's that great second coming when He comes back to earth. He, the Bible says he's going to step down on the Mount of Olives and it's going to split in two. And Zechariah says, those who pierced him will look and say, where did you get those wounds in your hand and your feet? And he's going to say, these are the wounds I received in the house of my friends. <laughs> Don't get me preaching. We've got to watch for him. But I want you to understand too, we ought to have a healthy fear of him. 
because the scriptures say we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in their body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. That's not whether or not you're getting into heaven. This is written to believers. The believers will stand before the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ and our lives will be put to the test. Our works that we've done in this life will be passed through the judgment fires. I, with you, are going to see a lot of wood, hay, and stubble burn up. I'm sure of that. I just want there to be more that comes out like precious metals tried by fire. By God's grace, with His help. Enjoy the Lord. Expect the Lord. And verses 6 and 7 tell us the third key, and that is entreat the Lord. Be anxious for nothing, but pray about everything. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. And now God's people said, oh me. (laughs) Really? Don't worry about anything? Hey, listen. God knows our frame and remembers that we are but dust. Worry is is one of those natural instincts that has come with a fallen nature. And we have this tendency to look at our circumstances, look at our surroundings, see things, like I said earlier, that aren't going right. Okay? Okay? And we worry. We worry. Now one of the reasons we worry is that we don't fully believe that God (laughs) is God. That God's got this. Well, this is going on in my family. But God. Well, you don't know what's happening with my finances. But God. With my job. my But God. But God, God does. And he knows what he's going to do. He knows how it's going to come out. He's got a plan. He's got a plan right down to the minutest little detail. Sometimes I'm amazed at the detail that God has in in my life and knows about. And and something happens and goes, I'm like, really? Really? Lord, you you were involved in in that little tiny thing? But he is. That's how big a God he is. That's how great a God he is. And so we can entreat the Lord with prayer. Right? Romans 12.12 says, continuing steadfastly, in prayer. That means faithfully, devotedly praying. Folks, please <laughs> pray. If you're not praying every day, right? What's the old the old saying? Seven days without prayer makes one week. W E A K. Why are we not spending more time in prayer? Why are we not devoting a part of our day to talking with God, to worshiping God, to bringing our concerns and our requests, our supplications to God? Why do we not spend some time, why do we not do that throughout the day? You know what we do? We we clutter our day with so much stuff. That even if God was trying to get our attention, we wouldn't hear Him. We've got the radio going. We've got the, 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 the computers going. The TV going. The phones are going. And, we, and, and we're just from morning till night. We need to spend time with the Lord. We need to... That, you know, that's what the word devotions means. We are devoting time to be with the Lord. And Paul says here, 
devote yourself to prayer. I, I'm, I'm convinced that God's people don't pray enough. And if we do, if we are praying, are we praying for the right stuff? Are we praying for the right things? Are we beseeching God for the souls of men? For the salvation of co-workers? The salvation of family members? Not an occasional prayer, but a steadfast praying. The word supplication means heartfelt petition arising out of deep personal need. We sang, I, I need thee every hour. I need, I need the Lord every hour. I need the Lord every minute of every hour. But you know what? I have this deep personal need to share the gospel with people. And I cry out to God for, to see souls saved. I want nothing more than to see people saved and to baptize them right here. I really, I mean, man, and, and before I became a pastor, before I, I was, I had that, that heart and that mind. I, I had a prayer list that I prayed every day because I didn't really know how to pray otherwise. I was still learning. And so I would take, you know, uh, 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 I would take notes at prayer meeting. And I would pray for people, you know, who, need, who, who were um, health issues, um, salvation, missionaries. I cut my teeth praying that way my spiritual teeth. I still pray that way. I have, I've altered it a little bit over the years. If I, I have to start my day with prayer. If I don't, I'm a mess. My day's a mess. I, I, can't, I can't even function properly because I haven't spent time with my Father. Truly. And, and all I can do is say, here's Paul. He's saying, you want a key to relieving anger and anxiety? Pray. Pray. Pray without ceasing and pray with thanksgiving. Pray with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving week, right? I love that video, by the way. Great video. It's not just once a year. What are we thanking God for? How about for the privilege of prayer? Wow. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom in half. No human hand could have done that. And what did that signify? Now through the blood of Christ and the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, Everybody has access to the Father. That's why Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 tells us to come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Why am I worrying and not praying? Why am I getting angry instead of praying? Hey, listen, I'm going to tell you, uh, just to let you know, Friday night was crazy. Friday night, I jumped in the truck. I was ready to go get our dinner. And something, I, I had to, I don't know why. I'm, I'll just share this with you. We had, we had another church using the fellowship hall. We let them do that every year at Thanksgiving. They had a great time. I let them in. I left. They called me. I was, I was halfway... Uh, the storage room that has the tables and chairs in it is locked. I said, that hasn't been locked in 22 years. <laughs> so I had to pull a U-turn, come back and unlock it. It was raining. I went back out. And I'm telling you, when it rains, 
everybody forgets how to drive. <laughs> everybody forgets how to drive. It was nuts. It was nuts. And I was just going down to McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I got back, I was very glad. I was, Thank you, Lord. <laughs> God, I, I, there were times on that little journey I had to pray. And God kept reminding me. Let me, let me say this. I know I'm going a little longer than I wanted, but there are times when stuff like that comes up, just those little annoyances where God's going to be testing our patience. He's going to be testing us. I will confess, patience has never been a great virtue of mine. God has been working it into my life over the years, and it has taken many years. And when I'm ready to lay on the horn and go, what are you doing? I go, all right, Lord. I mean, it's only going to take another minute, right? It, it, whatever. Whatever. And pray. Pray. With thanks for the privilege of being able to pray. With thanks that God is so good. With thanks that he not only hears us, he's anxious to hear from us. With thanks, as we saw in the video, for what he's done. I'm telling you something, folks. You start praying thanks for what you've done, you're going to be praying a long prayer. And then praying thanks for what you're going to do. Because whatever it is, he's good. Yeah. Key number four, I said enjoy the Lord, expect the Lord, entreat the Lord, experience the Lord. And that's why I had you kind of, I reiterated what, what Paul wrote there in uh, verse 9. I'll read that to you again. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Experience the God of peace. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to be anxious. Because the God of peace wants to replace that. He wants, he wants you to kind of snuggle up next to Him. And actually, the way Paul puts it here, He wants to come and be with you in whatever it is you're going through, whatever it is you're, you're walking through and experiencing. And, and He says, here's how to do that. First of all, by thinking right. Right? He, he says here in verse 9, whatever things, right? Whatever things are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and, and of good report, if there's any virtue in anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Think about them over and over and over again. Saturate your mind with them. I venture to say that for most believers, by the time we end our day, we've forgotten anything we've read in our devotions, in our Bibles, in our devotional booklets, you name it, in the morning. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying, for some, that may be true. Because we do a little bit of the good and noble and praiseworthy, and then we flood our minds with the not so good, not so noble, not so praiseworthy, not such good report the rest of the day. We have to be careful. We have to be careful. We have to know what's going on in the world. Absolutely. You know, but we do have to have right thinking. Isn't that what Paul said in Romans 12 too? Right? Don't be conformed to this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by thinking better. And thinking better comes from thinking better things. So experience the Lord by thinking right and then by living right. The things that you have heard and seen in me do. He said twice to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians, two different times, he said, imitate me. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. He said to Timothy, the things that you have heard and seen in me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Three times, four times, Paul says, do what I do. Live like I live. He didn't just preach it and then, right? I mean, he practiced what he preached. And if we practice what he preached, we will have the peace of God standing, or the God of peace standing with us. We Christians have more to be thankful for than any others. We have an eternal hope that's secure. We have a book full of promises that endure. We have an almighty God who cares. And we have an invincible Savior who will soon return. Anger shouldn't divide us. And anxiety doesn't have to define us. Enjoy the Lord expect his return, entreat him unceasingly with thanksgiving and experiencing and experience his all-comforting presence and peace. These are the keys to controlling and to defeating negative emotions, the negative emotions of anger and anxiety. And this is the way to foster peace and unity in a church and in a family. And, let me just say this, this is what people are longing for. So because actions speak louder than words, let's not just talk about it, let's model it. Today, I want you to know victory over negative emotions begins with a personal relationship with the victorious one, Jesus Christ. And it continues by yielding our hearts and our minds to the yielded one, Jesus Christ. And I wonder today, if you want to raise a hand, put it back down, you say, Pastor, I need victory over anger and anxiety. Pray for me. Amen. Amen. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Father, we come to you today and we thank you. We rejoice in who you are, in what you've done, in what you offer. Lord, what you're going to do. We praise you. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to fix our eyes on you, to keep us from being weighed down and divided by anger and anxiety. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to walk in the joy of the Lord and to share the joy of the Lord with those around us. People need you and people need to see that you're real in our lives. And I pray you'd help us with that. It is my prayer as we get ready to to celebrate the holiday, Thanksgiving, and then, of course, uh, swinging right into the Christmas season, um, that we would just not only be thankful and not only celebrate, but that we would be very mindful uh, that there is an entire world around us who needs Jesus Christ. They need the source and the reason for thanksgiving. They need the source and the reason of, of Christmas. And I pray, Lord, that you'd 
weigh it on our hearts heavily to be diligent about sharing Christ with those around us, inviting people to come hear from the Word of God, giving them gospel tracts, praying for them diligently, even if we don't know their names. I pray, Lord. I pray that the end of this year, the, this new year, would be transformational here at Heritage Park. And that the power of God and the Spirit of God would rest upon this church and that you would use us not to bring glory to ourselves, Lord, not to make us feel good about us, but to bring glory to you in your name and your precious Son. I pray it in his name. Amen.